All right, man, peace. So the CBS Morning News had a couple of good segments to promote a biographical book that has been written by an author named Walter Isaacson. Uh, and written, this book that he's written is in regards to the uh, great Renaissance painter and engineer, architect, all around polymath, known as Leonardo da Vinci. They want to talk about certain aspects of his life. And of course, I'm going to chime in. Let me just say that this painting that is to the left of the screen is known as the Salvatore Mundi, meaning the savior of the world. It is alleged to depict the entity known in the scriptures as Jesus Christ. But the entity that is that it is actually depicting is the God of the entertainment world and also the God that Leonardo da Vinci worshipped during his time period of the Renaissance, known as the Bacchus. And he used as a model for this painting uh, the boy that he raised and also uh, molested, known as Salai, S-A-L-A-I. Uh, he was a pupil of Leonardo da Vinci, and he, and he was also his, his lover, quote-unquote. Right? He was one of the boys that Leonardo da Vinci molested. But anyway, they're going to talk about Leonardo da Vinci, and of course, I'm going to chime in. The painting Salvador Mundi by Leonardo da Vinci could fetch $100 million at auction next month. Uh, let me say this before Jane Pauley goes on. And I mentioned this in previous historical videos that I've made. Uh, I've only lightly touched on history. Uh, I, am a, I am a fan of history. I am a, a student of history. Leonardo da Vinci is one of the great men of history. He was a brilliant man, even though he was, um, he was a degenerate. There's no doubt about that. But he was extremely talented. Uh, much of what you see in museums today is based off of the narrative that they want people to believe. Most of what you see in museums today is fabricated or forgeries. Okay? Or remakes, reprints. Uh, they're not authentic. There's, there are very few pieces of art or sculpture um, that, that is on the showroom floor that is actually real and legitimate. Most of the real artifacts are in the basements of these museums, which oftentimes double as fortresses. The Louvre, which houses most of Leonardo da Vinci's work, was a fortress and a castle for the old, um, for the old Capetian kings of France. For those of you who don't know, the Capetians, they were an offshoot of the Carolingian line, all right? Meaning uh, Charlemagne started a dynasty known as the Carolingians uh, in uh, the late 700s, or around 800 AD. And that line eventually ended in 928, and it started a line of French kings known as the Capetians, uh, started by Hugh Capet, first name H-U-G-H, -H, last name C as in Charlie, A-P-E-T. Anyway, that is when the Louvre first was um, known to be a, a, a castle that was used by the kings. I believe it was Louis XIV or Louis XVI is the one who decided to move the, you know, the uh, castle where the kings would live from the Louvre to the new place that he lived. And it's skipping my mind right now. I believe it was Versailles. Yeah, it was Louis XIV or the sixteenth. I believe it was the 14th who moved the palace from the Louvre to uh, Versailles. But you brothers could look that up on your own. Anyway, let's see what they have to say here. Just one part of his rich legacy. Our cover story is from Dr. John LaPook. They packed this gallery at the Louvre in Paris. At least six million people a year for a glimpse at a superstar. But a select few, like author Walter Isaacson, actually appreciate the Mona Lisa as art. It's the most famous painting in the world. And when you stand before it at the Louvre, you all of a sudden realize why. It's the most emotional painting. No, the reason why that painting is the most famous painting in the world is because that's a man in drag. For those of you who don't know, um, that, is depict that is also depicting Leonardo da Vinci's lover, and boy toy, Salai. Okay? That is who that is depicting. Uh, most of his paintings were, uh, he used Salai as the model or he used himself as the model. Now, there are some people who believe that, that this is Leonardo da Vinci himself in drag. 
I myself believe that it's a lie, just looking at the facial features. But that's the reason why it is the most commemorated painting, because uh, once again, the true God that is worshipped by the elite of this world, and this is going all the way back to even when blacks ruled in, in the latter part of the medieval time period, they started to worship the Bacchus. Now, Leonardo da Vinci, near the end of his life, uh, he was under the stewardship of Francis I of France, who was a black, who was a so-called black man and was king of France. And he also had a great rivalry with uh, Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire, as well as Henry VIII. All three of those men were so-called black. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was under the employ of Charles of, uh, pardon me, Francis I of France. But, you know, let's let him talk. I'll, I'll fill in as he goes. So she's been a celebrity for 500 years. We know a lot more about the celebrity artist who painted her than we do about Mona Lisa herself. Largely because her creator, Leonardo da Vinci, documented his life's work in painstaking detail. Look, let me say this. I've already stated this. Leonardo da Vinci was a genius. Uh, he was incessantly curious. He, uh, he pursued information and knowledge in every field that he could. Engineering, aeronautics, botany, um, anatomy, you name it. Architecture, art. Uh, he's what you know. He's, he is what is known as a polymath. P-O-L-Y-M-A-T-H. All right. Similar to Benjamin Franklin. All right. You know, and, and brothers, especially the brothers that are in the knowledge, you should you should have a similar mindset of being a polymath. You, you know, your mentality should be that you want to get as much understanding in as many fields as possible. All right. Don't just lean on this nonsense about the spirit and the spirit. Look, man, when the Most High is dealing with you in the spirit of truth, that means that you pursue and you research. That's what that means. And you don't research and look things up for competition. To say, look, I know more than this person or I know more than that person. You look it up for your own edification. Because the mind, even though you know your brain is an organ, is like a muscle. It can be strengthened. So that, that has to be the mentality that brothers have to have. And that's another way that you uh, can overcome and avoid the, you know, the low-level thinking process that many so-called pro-blacks have today. Where they're just looking for somebody to bail them out. Point being is this, um, we should not be looking for the validation of the so-called Caucasian. Uh, that's not manhood. But let's get back to this feature here. Some 7,200 pages of scribbles and sketches survive. You know, Leonardo may have been the person with the greatest amount of curiosity of any human who ever existed. And he would make lists in his notebooks of things he wanted to know. Like, how do they walk on ice in Holland? Or... Describe the tongue of the woodpecker. Now, who in the world would wake up one morning and put on their to-do list, describe the tongue of the woodpecker? Uh, it depends on what your mentality is. If you have an incessant yearning to learn and, and to improve your mind, then that's where it will go. Once again, you should seek to be as proficient in as many fields as, as you can when it comes to sharpening your mind. Okay? Even when you read in Wisdom of Solomon, the seventh chapter, uh, Solomon details all of the fields that he is an expert in. Right. And he goes through zoology and botany and meteorology, astronomy, things of that nature. OK. What use is it? But there it is. And over and over again, Leonardo is just putting down in his notebook things he's curious about. <laughs> Walter Isaacson's curiosity has given us best-selling books about Albert Einstein and Apple's Steve Jobs. And his just-released biography of Leonardo da Vinci, published by CBS's Simon & Schuster, will also be a film starring another Leonardo. Well, this is good that they have this nut job portraying the other nut job, okay? Because uh, let me say this, Leonardo DiCaprio is a brilliant actor, but he's also a nut, and he's a pawn uh, he's a point of the elite pushing a lot of the the, uh, the environment stuff. Uh, he's being he's a paid shill. They're paying him to do a lot of that stuff, but that's neither here nor there. In regards to Leonardo da Vinci, as I've stated, he was an extremely bright person, but he was also a degenerate. And one of the main reasons why they commemorate him so heavily was not is not only because of a lot of the things that he was able to discover and discern, but um, he was a major major part of a major part in history known as the Renaissance. Uh, that term means the rebirth. The Renaissance really came on the heels 
of something that I've spoken about previously, that being the uh, so-called bubonic plague, all right, which they aptly call the Black Plague or the Black Death. Why is that? Because when that scourge swept over Europe, it wiped out a large portion of the nobility of Europe, right? The nobility of Europe means the landowners. The nobility of Europe were the so-called black people, okay? This is why you see right in the aftermath of the so-called Black Plague or the Black Death that swept over Europe in the mid-1300s, you have what you call serf rebellions, okay? In England, you had the serf rebellions in the late 1300s because uh, the Caucasians, who were, who were acted as serfs and peasants and were not landowners, once they saw how this plague was affecting the uh, so-called Black nobility, the Black rulership, they tried to rise out of their vassalry, out of their... Uh, out of their state of servitude. Now they lie in history and tell you that the that the bubonic plague was so-called bubonic plague was spread by rats. No, I do not believe that at all. And there is very little data to prove that theory. Very little. Uh, what really is more uh, plausible and feasible when you understand true history is that a lot of the invading Caucasians from the east who were being pushed eastward by the expansion of the Mongols and the, and and the Turkish tribes they were pushed they were pushed from the east westward I should say and as they move westward many of the diseases that they brought with them the black nobility did not have any antibodies for and you see that once again in the 1400s and the 1500s when the Caucasians and the black nobility who were left who had the antibodies for those for those diseases brought them over here to the Americas and wiped out a lot of the uh, so-called black aboriginals who were here through those diseases. Okay? Uh, you know, when you look up a lot of the, the theories in regards to the black plague or the bubonic plague, uh, they'll tell you that th there really is no real basis for the belief that rats spread the disease because there are not any rat bones to coincide with the uh, with the bones and with the the uh, the skeletons of the people who died in that plague. It's very clear that what really wiped out most of the blacks of Europe in the 1300s was to move westward of the Caucasians from the from those mountainous regions in, in the Central Asian steppe as they were pushed into Europe by the Mongols and a lot of the other uh, Caucasian tribes who were moving out and expanding. I mean, it's a whole another topic for another day, but you had the Khazars who inhabited most of east of Eastern Europe. You had the Turks who came down into Southeastern Europe, down into the Mediterranean region, what you call Turkey and Northern Africa. And you had the Mongols who moved eastward. All right. Those are all Caucasian, uh, quote unquote, Caucasian tribes. All right. And that caused a lot of instability in the uh, in the economic setup that the black nobility had where they had these serfs a lot of the caucasians were working on their land uh as peasants or or what they call villains spelled v as in victor i l l e i n s um and they had no power whatsoever they had to work the land just to have a right to live on the land of the so-called black nobility or or the people who are called in history the um the celts the uh the franks the Lombards, the Normans, the Anglo-Saxons, etc. Those were black people. All right. And I'll cover that in a whole other uh, series once, you know, I have everything that I need to make those videos. But all those things spurred on the Renaissance, because once a lot of the black nobility were no longer as strong as they were, that led to a That led to a movement called humanism. Uh where people started to look less on the scriptures and on uh, spiritual understanding and more towards quote unquote rationale and the scientific method. Uh, these were things that happened a lot in the 1300s going into the 14, late 1300s going into the 1400s and Leonardo, and Leonardo uh, da Vinci was at the vanguard of that. Okay. He worked in Florence under a family, under a noble family known as the Medici's who were black by the way. OK, the Medici's was were so-called black, as were the uh, Sephorzas in Milan. OK, the lords and the nobility of 
the medieval time period all the way going coming into the 1500s, 1600s, even in some places into the 1700s were so-called black people, okay? But anyway. There's a story that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio has told, which is that when um, his mother was pregnant with him, she was at the Uffizi. There's a wonderful annunciation there. Looking at the painting, he starts kicking, and the dad says, we're going to name him Leonardo. <laughs> DiCaprio's namesake was born out of wedlock in Florence in 1452. Yeah, once again, Florence was ran by the Medicis, who were so-called black. Okay? Yes, they were. And, you know, before I forget, before it skips my mind, uh, in addition to the serf rebellions uh, that were happening in England in the late 1300s, you also have something called the, the Hundred Years' War. Okay? The Hundred Years' War was a major event that occurred in the reign of, of, uh, of Edward III of England. For you, for you guys who are familiar with the movie Braveheart, if you remember there was a king in there named Longshanks who William Wallace was going against. He had a son who was a, a homosexual named Edward II. Edward II had a child with the French woman in the movie, Isabella of France, named Edward III. Edward III came into power when he was able to overcome his mother, who tried to seize the th who tried to seize the throne with a man named Roger Mortimer, who, who she fell in love with. Anyway, to make a long story short, Edward III overcame uh, and took his throne back, and then he tried to claim the land in France that he felt like was his because uh, there was a claim that he felt was legitimate in regards to the northern part of France. I believe the region was called Aquitaine um, because the Norman invasion had came had come from France. And they had a duchy. A duchy basically was a region that is ruled over by a duke. And the Duke of Normandy uh, eventually became William, who was known as the Conqueror. He came over to England in 1066 AD and conquered the Anglo-Saxon king. I believe his name was Harold. I can't remember his last name. In 1066 AD, and they established a, a monarchy in England. Anyway, uh, Edward III was a, a, a descendant of William the Conqueror, and he felt like... Uh, that that land in France should belong to him as well. That started a war with France known as the Hundred Years' War. This also did a lot to hurt the black nobility in, in Europe, uh, destabilize it, and it led to a lot of the uprisings of the Caucasians who were in servitude at the time. Okay? The Caucasians in, in, in Europe at that time period, in the 1300s, going into the early 1400s, they were known as serfs in the western part of Europe. They were also known in the eastern part as Slavs, S-L-A-V-S. That's where you get the term slave from, okay? Not, not, not being racial or racist, nothing like that. It's just the truth, okay? So a lot of the infighting amongst the black nobility is what led to their downfall. But one of the main things that affected them was the so-called black death or the black plague, which is why they call it that, because it affected, these, it affected the so-called blacks more than it did the Caucasian. OK, this is why you look at Europe and you think that Europe that Europe is a Caucasian land It's really not. The Caucasian is not native to any land on the earth. OK, the only place that they're native to is Mount Seir uh, in the Middle East. And then also the Caucasus, you know, they moved up into the Caucasus mountain region of, of the central steppe of Asia. And then they pushed outward and came out with many uh, diseases. It's just a fact. OK. They were having sex with goats and animals while they were up in that mountainous range. That's where you get many diseases from. Okay? Just telling you facts. People might not like that. It is what it is. You can read a book called The 13th Tribe by Arthur Kostler, and he tells you how they were living up in those caves, and he was a Caucasian Jewish man. Uh, it is what it is. With little formal schooling, he was apprenticed at age 14 to an engineer and artist. And Land Yeah, most likely he was a pedophile victim himself. Uh, uh, I believe the, the person who took him under his wing was uh, named uh, Ver Veracoccio. And Leonardo's skill and imagination flourished. Yeah, there you go, Veracoccio. Or Veracoccio, excuse me. Florence was very tolerant of a guy like Leonardo who was left-handed and gay and vegetarian. And no, they weren't tolerant of, of no damn Leonardo da Vinci because he was gay. That's bullshit. Uh, Florence was controlled by the Medicis and... Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was actually going to be put on trial for sodomy, 
with three other men uh, who, who were caught engaging in sodomy with a male prostitute. OK, but he was let off because one of the one of the uh, one of the people who was involved with that act was uh, came from a rich family. It might it may have been a Medici. OK, once again, a lot of a lot of what you know as the Renaissance, which means the rebirth, which is the um, the implementation of humanism and the implementation of a lot of the Greco-Roman idealism of, uh, you know, say around the, right before the time of Christ. Right. A lot of those ideals were starting to be embraced by the by the uh, black nobility and it started to creep into their rulership and it started to be a cancer to their rulership and it allowed the Caucasian to rise up. They, you know, a lot of, you know, when you are a landlord and you were the lord of the manor, the, your servants, the peasants would have to fight battles for you. A lot of times the Caucasians who were peasants who lived on their manor, if they fought well in battle, um, they started to be given titles of nobility in the latter part of the black rulership. All right. And then you had Martin Luther who came with the Reformation, the uh, 95 Theses. And this was a major, major hit to the Catholic Church system, which was dominated by the uh, so-called black European nobility at the time, because the Reformation was based a lot in humanism. OK, but this this is all these are all videos for another day. I say all this to try to uh, make brothers or hope that brothers understand this is why Leonardo da Vinci is so venerated. And this is why he was such an important part of the Renaissance meaning rebirth, the rebirth of the Greco-Roman ideals. Okay? This is why they call the medieval time period the Dark Ages. Because during that time period, it was, you know, not only do they say that it was a lack of advancement and so on and so forth, but it's also a play on words. It's also why they use that term. This is also why the term Byzantine today is a metaphor for something that's backwards, because the Byzantine Empire was also ruled over by so-called blacks. Okay? Uh, all those men in the Middle Ages, Richard the Lionheart and King John and, uh, you know, Charles V and, you know, uh, you know, Louis the Pious, Charlemagne, all those men were black, man. <laughs> all of them. Hey, Holy Roman Empire, the Frankish Empire, the, all of it. You know, uh, uh, Castile, uh, you know, all of it. The kings in Scotland, they were all black men, man. And illegitimate. And it seems quite a hunk. Leonardo was also incredibly good-looking, in very good shape, extraordinarily athletic, long, curling hair. And I think that Vitruvian man, the guy in the circle in the square, spread eagle, I think it's partly a self-portrait. Oh, uh, it could be a self-portrait. It looks like that could be him. It could also be Silai, but it, it could be him. It's most likely him. But perhaps most of all, Leonardo was stunningly inventive. He makes a portable bridge, which you can just pop up in the middle of a, a battle if you have to cross a river. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, he definitely made a, a major impact as a military designer and engineer. This is when he came under the employ of a man named Caesar Borgia. Caesar Borgia. A lot of you brothers are familiar with Caesar Borgia. Uh, Leonardo fell under his patronage from, I believe it was the early 1500s, 1501 or 1502, one of those years. You brothers could look it up. And he was involved in the design of a lot of military equipment. And, of course, also, uh, Leonardo da Vinci decided to use Caesar Borgia as the muse for the image of Christ that we know today. Okay? In addition to um, his his uh, uh, pedophile victim, his boy toy, Salai, who he also used to, uh, to depict John the Baptist. So this also is what the Renaissance is also about, which is the defiling, the purposeful defiling of a lot of the, the uh, historical biblical figures, constantly to depict them as, you know, naked Caucasian men, you know, really to depict Bacchus. This is why you have, you know, David with a fig leaf over, you know, over his penis and things of that nature. Moses, uh, you know, with the horns, things of that nature. The Aspen Institute, the nonprofit think tank Isaacson helped to shape for many years, recently held a celebration of all things Leonardo on its Colorado campus. 
glider, and he did it in Milan off one of the... Sketches were transformed into three-dimensional models. The famous helicopter. I think it was first designed for the theater, because he was doing all these amazing props, having people fly and descend and ascend on the stage. Yeah, look, Leonardo da Vinci is a very interesting character. Uh, I, have, I, I bought a book many years ago uh, showing all of his sketches. Uh, he definitely was extremely inquisitive and a polymath, no doubt about that. An underwater diving apparatus. He said it would be a great way to sort of attack ships. In fact, he kept secret some of the details for fear that the enemies could figure it out. But it's Leonardo's sketches that may set him apart. Okay, this is the big moment. Right? <laughs> now so valuable that when curators at New York's Metropolitan Museum agreed to give us a peek... I'm actually nervous. Oh my goodness. At first they would only show us copies, until we promised to limit exposure to our television lights. Yeah, the copies they probably show you weren't even drawn by him, because a lot of shit that they show is fake. You know, when I saw these for the first time, it's like, oh my goodness, there's a hand of the artist. And it's just as if he were making it in front of me. Every time you see it, there's a new layer to appreciate. Here's the head of a man in profile. This is a design for a stage setting. A bear walking. And the head of the virgin. That's not no head of no damn virgin. That's the head of his boyfriend, Salai. Okay? That's, that's exactly who the hell that is. Something's happening here. Something's caught her eye. She has turned her head. It's a study for many paintings he would uh, do later, but you realize that he didn't just love objects. And this guy, Walter Isaacson, knows about all this shit already, but his job is to promote and push the narrative. Uh, Leon Leonardo da Vinci is, is heavily venerated because of the work that he did to push forward humanism and the Renaissance once again. And the, and the veneration of the god Bacchus, okay? He understands how human movements reflect the emotions of the mind. Only one Leonardo painting is in the collection of an American museum, this portrait of Ginevra da Vinci at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. How did it help change Renaissance painting? Well, up until then, uh, Renaissance painting had had sort of sharp lines and Leonardo said, that's not the way nature works. So there's a smokiness to the lines. But the great thing about this picture is you see a young Leonardo who's on the path to painting the Mona Lisa. Yeah, you might literally be looking at a young Leonardo. Because knowing him, that's probably, that's probably his face. And he's just there dressed up in drag. Once again, many of these, uh, many of these paintings that are depicted in sketches are sketches that he did of himself in drag or one of his male lovers in drag. He had a series of, of boy lovers, I should say. Not male lovers, boy lovers. Salai, uh, Francesco Melzi. Uh, the, he had quite a few. But this isn't the Mona Lisa. There's something else uniquely da Vinci about this portrait. Leonardo cared even about the parts unseen, so he paints the back of Ginevra da Vinci. We realize and he still has more to teach us. Leonardo even taught himself anatomy with dozens of human dissections. He documented how the aortic valve in the heart works, something researchers only confirmed in recent years. And then there's his knowledge of the eye. He realized that the center, when you're staring at something, you see the detail. And if you're slightly off, it goes to a different part of the retina. The well, all great artists had understanding of, uh, of that level of perspective in their art or composition in their art, uh, something known as the golden ratio. Right? The golden ratio is often used in art. The harder you look directly at the Mona Lisa's lips, the more it looks like her lips are turned down. But as your eyes wander, she starts smiling at you. That ain't no damn woman. So it flickers. I couldn't help thinking when you described that. Did Leonardo da Vinci figure out a way to have a painting flirt with the viewer? Yes. So, you see how sick a lot of these people... The fuck you mean a, a painting flirt with the viewer? What, you gonna have, try to have sex with the painting, man? Yes. He figured out a way to have it interact. In the Mona Lisa, you see the combination of all of Leonardo's anatomy and science with his... I see the combination of, of, of his sexuality. That's what I see. Okay. 
that's a, that's a man in drag. That is that is to lie. And once again, you have certain people who believe that it is Leonardo in drag. There was a there was a woman who is at one of the major visual art schools, I believe, here in New York, who stated that she did an, an experiment with Leonardo's uh, the measurements of his facial features and matched them to um, the Mona Lisa. I don't know how true that is. I don't see. I don't necessarily see Leonardo's face here. I see more Salai's face. But I mean, you never know. He was a he was a jester. He liked to mix a lot of uh, the bacchanalian and hermetic principles into his artwork. Meaning what? A lot of hermaphroditic aspects into his artwork. With his art. And what better way to discuss what may be this son of Florence's ultimate accomplishment, the Last Supper? Yeah, that, well, I don't know if it's ulti- if it's his ultimate accomplishment or um, one of the great subliminal messages in any painting ever. Then over an Italian meal. It begins with Jesus saying, one of you shall betray me. And you watch it. It's almost like... Now you see, right to the right of the figure who's supposedly Jesus uh, is, the, is the figure who's holding his finger upward. Uh, that also is for the... As above, so below. That's supposed to be Thomas. Okay? Now, to the left of the alleged Jesus figure is an entity that's clearly a woman. Now, people claim that that may be uh, Leonardo trying to sneak in Mary Magdalene. I believe that that is him sneaking in Salai again. Okay? Once again, Salai was his hermaphrodite boy toy. Or I shouldn't say hermaphrodite. I should say transgender boy toy. Okay? Who also was an artist himself. It's almost like a wave that reverberates out. Emotion, spirituality, and drama make this fresco one of the world's most admired works of art. There ain't no damn spirituality in this shit. Art. Studied down to the tiniest detail. Which is how we discovered what may be the origin of one of our most familiar superstitions. A cause of bad luck. It is certainly one of the greatest biblical moments ever which is Judas knocking over the salt in that painting. I didn't realize that. Is that where the superstition comes? Oh, yeah. Uh, that you yeah, knock yeah, yeah. over salt? Yeah. You can see the salt cellar. You can see everything. The artist... Now, this is supposed to be, uh, as I stated before, I believe I stated earlier in the video, um, France, that's Francis I of France. Uh, he was a black man. Now, in this painting, they depict him as, you know, looking like a Puerto Rican. I don't know. But no, he was a black man in real life, and he did hold Leonardo da Vinci in his arms as he died, allegedly, as I stated in the latter part of the so-called black uh, rulership of Europe. Many of them embraced humanism, Francis I, Henry VIII. Uh, no, this is right during the time period of, of uh, Martin Luther, during the time period that was known as the Reformation, which, which, pred- which uh, you know, determined the overall fall of the black rulership of Europe. Many of the religious wars of the 1600s, the Thirty Years' War, uh, a lot of the wars of, of secession, of succession, pardon me, uh, like the Jacobite Rebellion in Britain, were predicated off of religion, but also race. But anyway, you see da Vinci there, and that's Francis I. Engineer and scientist who lived a life of boundless curiosity, died in 1519. He was 67 and left no known children. How the fuck are you going to have children? He gay as hell. Come on, man. Leonardo da Vinci died a poor man. But, says Walter Isaacson, he left us. This, that's a probable self-portrait. I don't believe that Leonardo da Vinci drew that. I believe, just based on the art style, that that was Francesco Melzi. Uh, Leonardo. Francesco Melzi, for those of you who don't know, was... The boy that Leonardo da Vinci replaced Salai with after Salai got too old. Okay, once Salai got too old, Leonardo replaced him with Francesco Mel- Melzi. Oh, you know, in in history they call they call him a pupil. You know, he replaced him with a new pupil. No, he replaced him with a new lover. Okay, that's how you know he was a pedophile. He wasn't a homosexual. He was a pedophile. Left us a wealth. Well, I should just say just a just a damn degenerate. Wealth of lessons. Do you now find yourself looking at the world differently? 
I walked over here to the Metropolitan Museum through Central Park, and it took a little bit of extra time because he loved the way light hit leaves and formed shadows. He's somebody who says, pause for a moment and look at the way the water is falling into the pond. Those are the type of things he noticed, and I try to push myself to notice things that Leonardo would have noticed. Look, you should always notice things, but, you know, there are reasons why a lot of these people will get promoted. I'll leave it at that. All right, so now the CBS Morning News uh, with Gail and Charlie Rose and Nora O'Donnell, they also covered the promotion of the Leonardo da Vinci book. Let's see what they have to say. Best-selling author Walter Isaacson has written biographies of people with great minds like... Albert Einstein, Benjamin Franklin, and Steve Jobs. Isaacson is here with his new book. It's called Leonardo da Vinci, as you know by now. It's published by Simon & Schuster, which, by the way, is a division of CBS. Walter Isaacson, welcome. Hey, Gail. Boy, it is so great. Welcome. It's so great to see the history of Leonardo da Vinci that crosses all genres. But let's talk about Leonardo, because you describe him as a man of eye-catching beauty. Mm -hmm. I like that phrase. Of course you do with your old thirsty ass. Um, Yeah, let's talk about Leonardo. Uh, you know, polymath, uh, rampant homosexual and pedophile, massive degenerate, worshiper of the Bacchus. You know, that's Leonardo da Vinci in a nutshell. Flowing golden cur- curls, muscular build, uh, good physical strength, and a genius, but a different kind of genius, you say. Throw up a Vitruvian man, yeah, a wonderful like drawing. It. I think you he have it that there. Was his and I think that's a self-portrait of him. It, it fits his description totally. And it is an icon of connecting art and science. This is a drawing in which... Yes, he was at the vanguard of the humanist period and the scientific method. Okay. Uh, look, uh, and I cannot stress this enough. The humanist period is what the aboli- to, to the Caucasian in Europe is what the uh, the abolitionist period is to the so-called black man in in the early 1800s here in America. Okay, the humanist period is what got them out of their deep dark slavery, because what the humanist period did was it it got the black nobility to stop looking at them as just peasants to work on their land. Um, it got them to embrace the quote-unquote scientific method and to disavow a lot of the spiritual aspect of of, uh, of their belief system. Now, don't get me wrong. The uh, the so-called black rulership of Europe, uh, they were strict adherents to the Catholic Church, which was just a, a contorted version of the Babylonian mystery school system. So it, it was fated to not work anyway. But the humanist... Um, aspect of the humanist philosophical uh, ideologies that arose in the 1300s and 1400s that was a major factor in the downfall of the black rulership of Europe in which he gets every proportion exactly right he's been 230 measurements to get it right but he also does something of unnecessary beauty as he's standing there naked in the earth and in the universe, figuring how do we fit in. How is this genius different from other geniuses, though? Well, you know, some people like uh, Mozart say, great genius, but in a particular field. Uh, Mozart was also a so-called black man, by the way, as was Franz Joseph Haydn, right, and Beethoven. All those men were so-called black. To me, what's interesting is when you can cross fields. He thought of himself as an engineer, a scientist, an anatomist, somebody who loved geology. His notebooks are filled with all of his love of math and science and nature. Uh, Italy, Italy was the uh, the center of the Caucasian rise out of out of servitude. Okay, it was the it was the center of that rise. Italy was viewed as the epicenter for humanism and for, of course, for the Renaissance. You had a Renaissance prior to the Renaissance, was known as the Italian Renaissance. You had something called the Carolingian Renaissance, which occurred during the time of Charlemagne and his progeny, you know, in like the 800s, 900s AD. Uh, they were the first ones to, you know, start to em- embrace humanism to a degree. But uh, it, like I stated before, it wasn't until a lot of these other factors that emerged in the 1300s, that being the so-called Black Plague, the Hundred Years' War, uh, the Surf Rebellions, things of that nature, that really gave the Caucasian the impetus that was necessary for them to rise out of that, you know, of that deep, dark hole that they were in. 
all right, which started all the way back from the latter part of the Roman Empire uh, to that time. But also art. And so I think real creativity comes when you can see the cross currents of nature as opposed to getting all siloed. He was an expert in so many things, and yet he had no formal education. I well, most of your great geniuses um, are self-taught. That's normally how it goes, Miss O'Donnell. The college system is set up to really just uh, initiate the debt system, the credit ba the credit based debt system that uh, hangs over the head of most uh, so called educated people here in America. Uh, but if you if you were to read up on most geniuses, most of them are self taught. I think he was lucky. He was uh, lucky to be born out of wedlock, which meant he couldn't go to the university. So he became what he called, you know, a self-taught person. He and that also, uh, you know, was heavily why he was, uh, uh, he basically was a, an atheist. I won't even say an atheist. He was a believer in the hermetic principles, the hermetic philosophies, uh, the veneration of Bacchus. Had he had to, you know, had he been forced to in, in engage in any formal education, he would have been indoctrinated into the Catholic Church belief system. Became a disciple of experiments and experience. And this is the beginning of the scientific method in a way where people say, well, let me test the wisdom I've been given. Oh, before I forget, since he brought up the scientific method, one of the main tricks that Leonardo da Vinci played on people was the Shroud of Turin. For those of you guys who don't know, the Shroud of Turin was a hoax that was uh, perpetrated by Leonardo da Vinci. Supposedly, it was to replace a previous shroud that allegedly depicted the image of Christ for the uh, House of Savoy. Allegedly, this is the backstory that is alleged. But um, Leonardo da Vinci is is the one who those those who are in the know he perpetrated that that hoax um, by utilizing a a, um, a technique called camera obscura, which is an old ancient technique to use light to uh, embed an image on fabric if you overlay it with, I believe it's silver sulfate. I'm trying to remember which element it is that he, or which compound it is that he overlaid the, on the fabric to make it, to make it uh, get embedded on there. But it's a tactic or a technique called camera obscura, right? C-A-M-E-R-A, -E just like the word camera, last, and the second word is O as in Oscar, B as in boy, S as in Sam. C as in Charlie, U as an umbrella, R as in Roger, A as an apple. All right. So the the so-called Shroud of Turin does, does not depict Christ at all. That is Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. Once again. So he born just as the printing press comes about, Gutenberg, and he just reads everything, and he's a person in history who wanted to know the most about everything you could possibly it's know. It's almost the Aristotelian method in some ways, but mm -hmm. you write a. Oh, yeah. Aristotle, he was a so-called black man, too. Uh, Alexander the Greek was a Caucasian, but Aristotle was black. And I think I mentioned this already. Plato and Socrates, the, those men were all black, believe it or not. Write about his to-do list. Sometimes my husband uh, makes fun of my to-do list. But the thing, <laughs> we can <laughs> learn from Leonardo. I make know. I list. love that you say the to-do list. He just wrote about what is this? Figure out this. Every Why is the sky about. blue? What does the tongue of a woodpecker look like? Every day we get a list from him of the things he wants to learn. And it's sort of inspiring. And the, and the book is based on the more than 7,000 pages of notebooks. Yeah. What, what, what did we learn? What did you learn? Um, in the course well, of the, the cool research thing, we didn't know before. Well, the cool thing about the notebooks is that after 500 years, we can still flip through them and see day by day what he was doing. And fortunately, paper was slightly expensive. So on any particular page, he's maybe drawing a sketch. Of we know day by day what he was doing. He was molesting little boys. Get to the Last Supper, but then he's doing a little math experiment, and then doing mountains, and then doing the swirls and curls, and so you see how his mind leaps the, across. The paper is jam-packed. I, I love yeah. the Mona Lisa story. I mean, movie. look what you have on screen, man. The what? fetus in the womb is like a it's thing. Little, yeah. It's very detailed. His drawings are very interesting. That's why I would recommend that, that uh, Brothers purchase that book with his sketches in there. Uh, very interesting work. Yeah, but when you talk about the Mona Lisa smile, you said that he used to bring in musicians to make her smile. Right. But what I thought was interesting... I'm glad you believe that dumb shit, Gail. You believe in Santa Claus, too? Interesting is he would go to the morgue and look at cadavers and right. peel back to see the formation of a smile. Right. When you ask, you know, what do you find in the notebook? We have page after page of him uh, dissecting the human face 
It's showing every muscle, every nerve, whether the nerve comes from the brain or the spinal cord. And then, after a few pages of it, the first slight sketch of Mona Lisa's smile. So we Look, this guy, this guy did all this research on Leonardo da Vinci, so he knows everything that I'm saying. He knows that all of these paintings that Leonardo did, the vast majority of them were based off of either himself or his boyfriend, Salai, or, or uh, Cesar Borgia. And with the sole intent of really just trying to deface the um, what was recognized as the normal image of the entities of the Bible, the normal images of the entities of the Bible. When you go through the Holy Roman Empire and you look at the, the real relics, they, they were always depicted as so-called black men. All right. Now, you had a man named Thomas Cromwell, who I believe was the grand uncle or somewhere along the line. He was related to Oliver Cromwell, who helped lead the parliamentarians in overthrowing uh, the, the line of King James in the in the uh, mid 1600s. You had a man named Thomas Cromwell, who was the Lord Privy Seal for Henry VIII. His job was to destroy all the relics in England. At the time, those were the Catholic relics, but they, those were all the relics that depicted the original, um, you know, the original black images, not only of the kings and the queens of of the British Isles, but also the depictions of the saints. As I stated, they were Catholic, so they were into relic worship. So we see how the science connects to the art, and it's inspiring. Part of it's eerie. Yeah, it is it, it, eerie, but, you know, he just had this passionate curiosity for curiosity's sake. And so he's doing anatomy dissections, but he realizes that the beauty of the human body is connected to the beauty. So where did that drive come from? It, it was just innate for him. Did he just no, it I don't think so. I mean, I think there's certain innate geniuses. Einstein is one of them where, you know, whoa, he got some processing power. But I think with Einstein, I mean, with Leonardo da Vinci, he pushes himself. To just right, but that's also a form of genius, to push yourself, to actually want to learn. Look, I don't deny that the man was a genius. He was just a degenerate. To just be more curious, as Nora said, you read those lists of things he wants to learn. And so that's why he's a more accessible genius than some of the others I've written about. Because we can do that, too. We can, like, he would just say, why is the sky blue? It would be in his notebook, and he'd do it. You've, been, you've compared him to Steve Jobs. We've been saying yeah. all morning, you're going to tell us why the, the two you see. Well, you know, whenever Steve Jobs would launch a great product, I mean, I see all of his products all over yes. your table and in my pocket. Yeah. At the end, he would show the intersection of two streets, liberal arts and technology and he'd say if you can stand at the intersection of the humanities and science or arts and engineering that's where creativity occurs to me that's what the Trivian man is all about and leonardo da vinci is all about all right walter they're playing the music it's time to wrap it up all right we already know your book is going to sell like hot cakes i might even get it because I, I would like to get some insight uh into a topic like this but anyway brothers uh, point being is uh, you know, they're, they're promoting a lot of this. I just wanted to use this as a backdrop to you know lay out a little information on the Renaissance and uh, the atmosphere around it. I'll be covering this topic a lot more in depth in future in future videos, Lord willing. But anyway, peace. All right, so now this is the person that I've been mentioning in the video on Leonardo da Vinci named Salai. Uh, this was a young boy who moved in with Leonardo da Vinci when he was 10 years old uh, and an artist apprenticeship or what they call a pupil. But he also was taken as Leonardo da Vinci's uh, boy lover, which was very common during that time, especially in Renaissance Italy. Uh, they would take boy lovers as apprentices and uh, they would make them pupils. And then when they got a certain age, they would cast them to the side and they would bring in a, another young boy. Uh, once again, that is part of the belief in the Bacchus. OK. Remember, Pan is uh, engaging in, in pederasty, which is man-boy love. Anyway, this is Salai. This is the person that I stated uh, stood as the inspiration and the model for most of Leonardo da Vinci's, uh, most of his paintings. Uh, most of his famous paintings that people try to act like they don't know who they were. No, no, that's Salai. You're you playing games. All right. But anyway, this is Salai as John the Baptist. OK, so-called John the Baptist. Uh, look very closely at the face. You can see that's also Mona Lisa. OK, this person is Salai, is Leonardo da Vinci's uh, boy lover. This is the original sketch that Leonardo da Vinci did of Salai that he was going to use to play, that he was going to use as the model for John the Baptist. This is a drawing known as the angel incarnate. 
okay? Because this is how he looked at that boy, Salai, as an angel. Uh, he was, quote unquote, in love with him and in a, quote unquote, relationship. All right, starting from the age of 10 years old. Now, once again, you can see he has breasts and he has an erect phallus and the right finger is pointing upward. The uh, same way that I mentioned in the drawing for the Last Supper, when Thomas had the finger pointing upward, that is for the Bacchus or as we know, as we know him today, the Baphomet, as above, so below the worship of the uh, Hermetic principles. OK, let's go back one more time. That is Salai as the uh, as John the Baptist. This is a drawing of Salai uh, that uh, Leonardo da Vinci did in preparation for his John the Baptist painting. Okay, this drawing is known as Angel Incarnate. You can look it up. You see, he has the erect phallus there, and he has the finger up in the air. Also, in uh, Leonardo da Vinci's sketches in his sketchbook, he has a drawing of Salai's anus being pursued by penises on on that have feet running towards his anus. Okay, so. That's how they get down. That's how they got down in the Renaissance <laughs> and during the, the in, in the worship of the Bacchus. This is also Salai as the Bacchus itself. This is a painting that you could look up by Leonardo da Vinci called Bacchus. He, he, he uses Salai as the model. Once again, you see the fingers, uh, right finger pointing one way and then the, le the left finger pointing downward as above. So below. OK. And the legs crossed. Uh, he plays the Bacchus, the hermaphroditic god. Remember, Bacchus is a hermaphrodite. This is another painting of Salai, known as the Mona Vanna. You can look it up. M is in Michael, O is in Oscar, N is in Nancy, N is in Nancy, A is in Apple, and then Vanna, V is in Victor, A is in Apple, N is in Nancy, N is in Nancy, A is in Apple. This is depicting him as a as a uh, hermaphrodite, having both male and female parts. Once again, just like the drawing Angel Incarnate that I showed you. And you look at the face. That is clearly the same person who stood in as the model for the Mona Lisa. There goes the Mona Lisa. Same person. All right? Same person. There goes the, the so-called famous Mona Lisa uh, painting or depiction that they try to act like they don't know who that is. Uh, at one time, I thought it was Leonardo, but, you know, it's very obvious to me after after research that that was his boy lover, Salai. OK, Salai was eventually replaced by another boy named Francesco Melzi, uh, who was with Leonardo until he died in 1519 in the court of Francis I of France. Hey, oh, and by the way, the name Salai means a uh, little devil or unclean one. OK, so that was the person that Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was quote unquote in love with for all those years until he was replaced by another little boy. So this th these are the type of people that they venerate. But the reason why they venerate them is because they were key in pushing and promoting the worship of the Bacchus. All right. Who was also known in other cultures as as Osiris or, you know, as we know him in the scriptures as Nimrod, the son of Cush. But anyway, peace.